In contemporary culture, it is a very common view that science and Christianity do not mix very well. You can think of this cover on Time magazine, God versus science, and you had boxing gloves. So the image is that it has been a fight between God and science, and God did quite well early on, but for a number of centuries now, it's gone really bad for God. And, and honestly speaking, science has knocked God out of the ring. That's the kind of, of image perspective we have. A world-leading cosmologist, Lawrence Krauss, uh, well known uh, for his book, uh, A Universe from Nothing, he said this in The New Yorker, all scientists should be militant atheists. So of course you, you can be a religious person, you can be a person of faith, you can be a Christian, you're welcome to be that, but you cannot be a scientist. If you want to be a real scientist, you need to be an atheist. So we have the same perspective here. A lot of uh, people in Europe who have had a Christian background or have been Christians and then have left the faith, if we ask them, why have you left the faith? A huge number of them would refer to science. They have bought into this picture. So they say, sorry, but uh, science has shown that Christianity is not true. It's a kind of either or, and I cannot reject science. Therefore, I reject the Christian faith. So this is a, a big and important issue. The, um, the question is, of course, is this, this picture of the relationship between uh, science and Christianity, is that image true? When uh, Albert Einstein was asked about if he stood on the shoulders of Newton, so Isaac Newton, by many viewed as the, the greatest scientist of all time, and then Einstein is, uh, is uh, high up on the list, him too. So they asked him, are you standing on the shoulders of Isaac Newton? And Einstein replied, no, on the shoulders of Maxwell. Now James Clerk Maxwell was an evangelical Christian who outlived Darwin. And Einstein referred to him. And on the wall at his study, Einstein had a picture of Maxwell. Interesting. It seems like it's not that obvious that it is, it is a basic conflict. Maxwell, one of the greatest scientists of all time, he was an evangelical Christian. Okay, let's take a, a deeper look into this. So my first main point is the history of science. That's a academic subject. You study the history of, of science. In the late 19th century, there were two books published uh, by, uh, by American academics. The first book was called, or had the title, The History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science by John William Draper. And in the book, he claimed that the Christian church became a stumbling block in the intellectual advancement of Europe for more than a thousand years. That is one of the main sources for this scenario that there is a conflict between science and Christianity. It goes back to this book, which was printed in many, many, many editions, translated to many, many, many languages. It's out in Swedish in an old edition because it fitted so well the feeling of the time that there is a conflict, that we need to leave Christianity behind us. And th this book claimed that historically, the church has always stood in the way of real science. Another book uh, uh, written by Andrew Dixon White had a title, A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology. So there's a war going on. 
on one side science, on the other side you have theology, you have the Christians trying to defeat science. The image of, of the war and the conflict goes actually back to those two books who have had an enormous influence far beyond their, uh, their, their actual value. One of the things they had as evidence of this conflict is that they claimed that Christianity claims that the earth is flat. And when I ask students in Sweden, have you heard that Christianity claims that, or have had claimed that the earth is flat? There's always a number of hands. Yeah, that was what we are taught in school. That idea comes from these two books, who says that the, that was the view of the church. And of course, that's against science. We know it's, uh, uh, it's not a flat earth. Well, historically, that's a totally wrong picture. In Europe, people knew long before Christianity that the world is round. The Greek philosophers in the 5th century BC had figured that out, and that became common knowledge. No writer after that time claims that the earth is flat. And when the church started to grow, in the culture, people knew that the earth is round, and the church had no reason to object to that. They accepted that the earth is round. Here is uh, Roman coins, and that is the Roman emperor. That's the backside of it. And the Roman emperor is, of course, lord of the whole world. What is he holding in his hand? A globe, a sphere. They knew the world was round. What happened when Christianity became the dominant perspective? Well, they, could, they, they wouldn't say that the emperor, Caesar, is Lord. They would say Jesus is Lord. So what did they do? They put a cross on the globe. Uh, those are three things going down there is symbols of the three continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. I think we can forgive them that they, they didn't know about Australia and, and, and the Americas. But they knew the, the earth was, was round. And now it's Jesus, of course, who is Lord over the whole world. So what's at the top of St. Peter's Church in Rome? It's a globe. And on the top of the globe there is a cross. So there's a number of myths that have just is just floating around in culture and they fit with our culture's skeptical stance towards Christianity, but they have no historical foundation. It's really interesting if you look into uh, the history of the universities, and of course science grew out of the universities. Where do the universities come from? Well, they come from the monasteries, where the monks have started to uh, build up libraries, where there were uh, dissertations, lectures, uh, originally mainly on biblical and theological issues, but gradually on many, many, many uh, uh, issues. And out from the monasteries, the universities grew. They have Christian roots. Here is an academic book on history of the universities in Europe. And in the preface, it says, in the preface, it says, the university is a European institution. Indeed, it is the European institution par excellence. It is the creation of the medieval Europe, which was the Europe of papal Christianity. So the universities comes from Christianity. The world's uh, second oldest university is the University of Oxford, and today it's the most prestigious of all universities in the world. Here is their logo. You see, it's an, it's an open book. What book is that? It's a Bible, of course. And then it says something in Latin, and I don't know Latin, but it's easy to have it translated. Dominus illuminatio mea. It means, the Lord is my light. It's a quote from Psalm 27. Do you see a conflict here between science and Christianity? No, the universities and science is built upon the Christian faith. This is the chemistry institution of Cambridge, another world-leading institution. Many Nobel Prizes have been given to scientists at that institution. 
So what's above the entrance of the original chemistry institution? The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. That's a quote from the psalm. If you love the Lord, you love the work he has done. This is his world. We are called to investigate and understand it. So they were driven by the Christian faith to explore this world. Here's another uh, prestigious university, often number two after uh, Oxford on those kind of rankings, Harvard. Their motto is veritas. That means truth. But that's not the original motto. Originally, it looked like this. It says, veritas in Christo et Ecclesia. Truth for Christ and the church. And if you look closely, you can see that on the original shield, there are three books. Two of the books are, are open, so you can read them, and one is upside down, it's closed. That's the two books of the, of the Bible, the two sections of the Bible. The closed books is symbolizing we have not access to all knowledge. There are secrets that only belongs to God, so that book is, is closed. Uh, the new shield just says, says veritas, truth, and now all three books are, are open uh, because there are no divine secrets to uh, at all. We can go on and, and look at this. This is a coherent pattern. Here is another prestigious university, University of California. Uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, I guess, is the most uh, famous of its um, uh, campuses. Here we do not even uh, need to know uh, Latin. It's an open book, it's the Bible, and the first verse of the Bible is quoted. Let there be light. There is not a conflict, a war, between Christianity and science. It is the opposite relationship. Rodney Stark is a scholar who has investigated a lot of research into this issue of the history of science. Science. He says, not only were science and religion compatible, they were inseparable. Christian theology was essential for the rise of science. Christian theology was essential for the rise of science. What was it within Christian theology that gave the impetus for science? Well, it was a number of things. It was biblical perspectives. Ideas from the Bible planted in the minds of people in Europe that inspired science, like this. On the first page, they read, this is the creation of God, but it was handed over to man, or to, to humans, to subdue the earth and take lordship over it. And the only way you can do that is to try to understand it, to analyze it. So to obey the will of God, we need to understand his world in order to subdue it. They believed in a God who is logos, who is rational, who is mind. So they were not surprised when a creation from him is rational. And it was not a surprise when you can formulate rational, uh, or you can form right laws, natural laws, that there is order in the universe, because it comes from a God who is Logos. They believed, of course, there is only one true God who has created everything. That makes a huge difference. Most cultures in world history has been polytheistic, many different gods, and in a polytheistic system, the different gods are connected to different phenomena of nature. So you have a god behind the sun, another behind the moon, all the stars, there are different gods behind them. There's a god behind thunder and storm and the sea and love and music and sex and wine and... <laughs> but those different gods who have their specific sphere, they are not united. There are chaos between them. They betray each other. They lie to each other, they fight against each other. So, B 
beyond this world, amongst the gods who control this world, there's just chaos. Therefore, <laughs> there's no meaning to try to understand what's going on. But if you're a monotheist, you, you think there's one God and he's behind all phenomenon in this world. So you can expect a universal order. They thought the universe was created. That sounds uh, <laughs> obvious, but this makes a, a big difference. Among the Greek philosophers, there were some impetus to, to science and they did some discoveries. But they were thinking in terms of, of ideas and they were thinking about what is the, the perfect, for example, the perfect form. So the circle is the perfect form, better than the ellipse. So they were sitting at their desk trying to figure out how it must be, what is the perfect. Christians couldn't do that because they were aware that God is free to create whatever universe he wants. He can create the universe like that, or like that, or like that. He can use circles or ellipses or... What universe did God choose to create? We cannot know unless we go out and look at the universe. So science became empirical, experimental. We need to find out. And that was one of the really great breakthroughs for science. Not sitting at your desk, investigating the real world. And theologians taught that the universe is created ad extra. That means, that's Latin, it means outside, outside of God. So God and the universe is not the same. A number of cultures are pantheistic. They identify God or the divine with the universe. They melt together then you should meditate over the universe because it's divine or worship the universe. You're not inspired to investigate it because it's a mystical uh, reality. In the animistic world, like in, in the old religions in, in Africa and South America, they believe in spirits in the, the ground and trees and in the stones. And if you do the wrong thing against nature, those spirits will attack you, curse you. So they were afraid. But in the Christian Europe, people knew God is not identical with the universe and it is God we should worship. And this earth have been handed over to us and there are not spirits in the ground or in the trees or in the... St we do not need to be afraid that freed up people to actually do experiments with this world. Here's another book uh, on the history of science. They say, science in its modern form arose in Western civilization alone among all the cultures of the world because only the Christian West had the necessary intellectual presuppositions underlying the rise of science. Now, let me be really clear here. In all cultures, there have been uh, geniuses. There have been really interesting uh, discoveries. If you look to the ancient Egyptians or ancient Babylonians or ancient China or India, uh, but they have not started, that had not been the starting point of scientific uh, explorations. That has stopped with just this, this discovery. They have not started a systematic investigation into this reality as a whole. That happens only in Europe. So I'm not, and one should not uh, deny all those uh, fine discoveries, but it, it stopped with a, an individual discovery, or it was, uh, uh, it was kind of polluted with their religious uh, convictions. So for example, the Babylonians, they understood quite a lot about the heavenly bodies, about the stars. So they were good in astronomy, but they combined it with astrology, which is a false understanding. And therefore it limited their astronomy because it was combined with those false ideas. 
A simple way to, uh, to illustrate this is trassel in Swedish, a tangle. No one is tempted to try to analyze this. What's the exact relationship between every thread? How are they? It's just a tangle. Compare that with that. That's a crossword. And if, if you're like my wife, you would be immediately tempted to solve that. No one is tempted to solve that, but that, there's a mind behind that. There's a meaning behind all the lines and all uh, the, the, um, the leads, the information, and you know there is a right way to figure it out. And that is what the, the Christians could think about this universe. It's a crossword. And it's possible to solve. But most cultures in the world have been thinking of the world like that. And then some genius have been able to take out one thread. Whoa! But they've stopped with that. So the true history is that it, it is the Christian faith who is the foundation for science. Secondly, one needs to have a clear understanding of the limits of science. Now, I think uh, everyone is obliged to love science. You have to love science. We enjoy the results of science every second of our life. So here we are in, inside this room with electrical light, with computers, with refrigerators, we have uh, modern medicine, we have transportations, and all that is, is uh, practical applications of <coughs> scientific discoveries. So if you don't love science, <laughs> you have not understood how drastically science have changed our world for good. So one has to love science. But one needs also to see the limits of science. And this is a huge problem in our culture, that people misunderstand uh, what science can do for us. And that misunderstanding uh, is amongst philosophers called scientism. You make an ism, a full worldview of science. Here's an example. Axel Rosenberg is an atheistic philosopher, and he promotes scientism. And see what he's saying. Science as our exclusive guide to reality. That's scientism. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem with that statement is those two words, exclusive and reality. If he had said science is our best guide to nature, I would totally agree. Science as the best guide to understanding nature. We have no better guide than that. But if you say our exclusive, the only guide to reality, that's deeply problematic because reality is more than nature. Reality is history. I usually ask students, do you celebrate your birthday? And students always say yes. And my follow-up question is, how on earth do you know which day you were born? Science cannot tell you. Science can absolutely not tell you which day you were born. So how do you know? So what do you say? How do you know? Which people? Mom and dad. Yeah! <laughs> and they are really good witnesses. Your mom was there. <laughs> It's really hard to, to think of a better witness than your mom and dad. And then in addition, we have historical records because there was a nurse making notes. Oh, there was a boy born at that time, that day, with this length and this weight. And, and then there was a secretary putting that into the, the historical records. So I can look it up. So I have two really good sources to know my birthday. None of them are science. 
but I have no reason to, to doubt it. Unless my, my parents are not, you know, if, if they are mentally uh, uh, sick or, you know, there can be exception. But in all normal cases, of course I can trust when my mom says what day I was born. And if I come from an orderly country, I can trust the historical record. But it's not scientific knowledge. If you go through what you would consider knowledge in your life, 95% is not from science, but it's still true knowledge. And this is the huge mistake people do. They, they think that the only true knowledge is scientific knowledge. And that's false. Science gives us the best knowledge about nature and its functions, but other no uh, kinds of knowledge we receive from other sources. How do we know good and evil? How do we know history? How, do, how can we know that human beings are valuable and have dignity? Science cannot tell us. Sci science is absolutely si silent on all the important questions. And of course, science cannot say anything about God. Science can investigate into nature and the functions of nature, but God is not part of nature. So if one expects science to solve the question about God, they have totally misunderstood what God is. God is outside and before this world. He's not something you can discover within the universe as a thing in a test tube or uh, something like that. So, science is a wonderful tool. We need to love science. I hope I've underlined that. <laughs> I'm really for science. But it is within a narrow area. And when applied on other areas, a scientific answer to God or human dignity or good or evil, that's totally stupid. On those issues, science should be silent because science cannot tell us anything. So science can discover nature, not the supernatural. But it's still possible that we can have knowledge about the supernatural, like we can have knowledge about our birthday. It's just it comes from other sources. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, has said this, the great delusion of modernity is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. No, the laws of nature describe the universe, they describe the regularities, they explain nothing. That's actually a profound statement. The laws of nature describe the universe, but they do not explain anything. They describe how the universe works, but all the question of where does the universe come from and why is it functioning this way is beyond science. It's also important to see that uh, when it comes to areas where science can say something, the scientific explanation of something does not exclude other explanations. Here is the schoolbook example from philosophy. Uh, when you talk about different levels of uh, explanation, you see that that, that is a, a water kettle and you can see that the water is boiling because there's steam coming out. And so then we have the question, why is the water boiling? So what would science tell us? Why is the water boiling? Because there is a source of heat underneath it, which, and then you can give the full scientific explanation of why the water molecules uh, move and blah, 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 blah. so so we can explain scientifically why does the boil uh, water boil but you can also ask the question why is the water boiling and then you can answer because I want a cup of tea that's a personal explanation to the same phenomenon and it's equally true and it's not either or so if the one explanation is true the other can't be true no 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 both explanations can be equally true. And this is not a new insight. The philosophers 
at medieval time knew this, uh, Thomas of Aquino, for example. So they talk about primary and sec uh, secondary causes, where God is the primary cause to everything that exists. And then we can discover the secondary causes of things that are happening within, uh, within the world. So when Newton discovered gravity, he was not thinking, oh, now I understand that, therefore there is no God. No, not at all. He had understood some aspects of this world, and he was amazed and said, wow, there must be a mind behind a system like this. So a personal explanation does not, or a scientific explanation does not exclude a personal or a divine explanation on another level. Thirdly, the conversation with science. So how is it today with the relationship between science and the Christian faith? Historically, it's been really good. Science come from Christianity. What's the situation today? Well, here's my example, the Big Bang Theory. Not a TV show, but the scientific theory. And there's so many misunderstandings here. I constantly meet non-Christians saying to me, well, you know, uh, I don't believe in God, I believe in the Big Bang. And then I go to church and then the Christians tell me, I don't believe in Big Bang, I believe in God. And on both sides, it's an either or. It's God or Big Bang. That is a huge misunderstanding. Let me explain why. 100, 150 years ago, the dominant position amongst a lot of scientists and a lot of philosophers was that this universe is eternal. Here's a Swedish Nobel Prize winner in, winner in chemistry in 1903 saying, the universe in its essence has always been what it is now. So a, a, an eternal universe. Now that is a position that fits very well with, with atheism, but sits badly with Christianity. And at that time, the atheists, they said this, okay, you Christians, you say God has created the universe. If we then ask you, but who created God? Then you say, oh, no one created God. He has never came into being. God is eternal. He just is. He has no cause. Everything stops with his eternal existence. Okay, said the atheist, we hear you. We have a much easier solution. We get rid of God, and then we say about the universe, exactly what you just said about God. It's just there. It's eternal. It has never come into being. It just is. And you can say that 100 years ago. But then something started to happen. Or let me back up. This illustrates a very interesting fact that everyone needs to start with something that is eternal. No one can start with nothing. Why? That's because of the old philosophical principle, from nothing, nothing comes. So if you have nothing, nothing can come out of that. From nothing, nothing comes. But today something is here, you and I, this universe. So something is here. So because something is here, we can draw the conclusion something must be eternal. So it's either what is here that is eternal, or it's something else that is eternal that has caused what is here. But no one has the luxury of beginning with nothing. So it's either this world that is eternal, or it's something else that is eternal and that has caused this world. hundred years ago, people said, well, it's this world. We do not need anything beyond this world. Then things started to happen. And you recognize one of the, uh, the men here. So you have Einstein. That's another Nobel Prize winner, Robert Millikan, cosmologist. And there is a guy in the middle with a priestly collar. It's actually a Roman Catholic priest, but a world-leading scholar. His name was George Lemaitre. And he's the one who is first formulating the Big Bang Theory saying, it looks like the universe is not eternal. 
it has a starting point. The universe has an age. And this was really frustrating for the scientists at the time. Here you have Einstein and Lemaitre. And Einstein has written that he did everything in his power to try to disprove Lemaitre. Because everyone realized what it implied. If this universe is not eternal, something else must be eternal. You're opening the door for God. <laughs> and people didn't want that. The Big Bang Theory has been a great comeback for God. Because now we know that the alternative of an eternal universe is out of the picture. C.S. Lewis realized this, and already in 1943, he wrote this. In one respect, as many Christians have noticed, contemporary science has already come into line with Christian doctrine and parted company with the classical forms of materialism that everything is just matter. If anything emerges clearly from modern physics, it is that nature is not everlasting. The universe had a beginning. And then he adds a very important note. We should not lean too heavily on this for scientific theories change. But at the moment it, it appears that the burden of proof rests not on us, but on those who deny that nature has some cause beyond itself. It's wise to say, Science changes all the time. There are revisions and new discoveries. But according to current position, interesting thing is, since 1943, the Big Bang Theory has been confirmed on a, a number of points and is today the standard theory about the universe. So it's much, much stronger today than it was at the time of, uh, of Lewis. And of course, this fits very well with the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God, who is eternal, created heaven and earth. So here's a very interesting point of discussion between science and Christianity today. And whatever popular books on uh, cosmology you buy today, you will find a chapter on God. And that's because of the Big Bang Theory. Everyone needs to discuss this. How could something begin? And then they have discovered things within uh, the, the beginning, uh, what's called the fine tuning, which is just amazing. It looks like it was started by a mind. So God is back in the discussion in a way he was not 100 uh, years ago. I have uh, not addressed some of the points of conflicts because we, of course, should be very honest that there has been some real conflicts. The most, the most famous is, of course, between the church in Galileo and where the church made a huge, huge mistake uh, in how they responded to Galileo's theory. And uh, we have, of course, the discussion around Charles Darwin and evolutionary theory, um, a, a discussion where, in one sense, the jury is still out and Christians have different, different ways of, of uh, dealing with it. So one shouldn't give the picture that there has never been any tension or conflicts. Uh, but that is also natural, that there will be that kind of, of conflict and tension. The atheists, they have had tensions with the, <laughs> the Big Bang Theory, for example. Uh, so it's, um, uh, it's not, um, it's not uh, surprising that during a long history you will have, uh, you will have tensions and conflicts uh, at some points. But the overall picture is not at all that it is a conflict between science and Christianity.